Right, hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I make that one o'clock. I'm going to get started because we've got quite a lot to get through. Um, thanks for joining our um, breast pain webinar. Um, it's uh, quite an important topic to, and one that is quite common in, um, in presentation in primary care, hence why we're doing it. Um, and we hope you'll uh, find that this is a useful and informative uh, webinar and plenty of um, experts on the call. Sorry, I've got lots of beeping going on um, uh, to answer questions as well. So we want to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so I'm Jo Thompson. I am a GP in Sussex. I've been a GP for 20 odd years now. Um, so I see quite a lot of breast pain patients. Um, I'm also a CRUK GP and I'm joined on the line with no voice, unfortunately, because she's poorly by Kat Hodges, um, who is uh, my counterpart at Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance. So we're the primary care leads. Um, so today we've got um, uh, Addie Mitchell uh, and Susie Halliday joining us, as I say, with a wealth of experience between them. Uh, so Susie is a breast care nurse consultant at Surrey and Sussex um, Hus uh, SASH, and she's one of three nurses on the National Aspire audit run by um, the ABS on breast, uh, the Association for Breast Surgeons, I think I've got that right, Susie, on breast pain pathways. And Addie is a uh, nurse from Breast Care Now, which is a charity supporting pe uh, people with breast cancer and also the Worried Well. So <clears throat> today's um, webinar is basically to kind of give you a flavour of how to manage your breast pain patients um, and um, hopefully to reassure you that, um, that there are processes in place to manage them should you be unable to manage them in primary care. Um, just a couple of uh, house housekeeping points first. Um, as you can see, the webinar is being recorded so that we can share this uh, a bit wider and for people that aren't able to join us at the time. Um, so if you could keep your cameras off and your microphones on mute, that would be really helpful. Um, we're going to use the chat box if that's okay with everybody to put questions in the chat um, and we're going to have some time um, in between the speakers to answer questions and then some time at the end as well if there's anything that comes comes up that needs to be answered. If we can't answer them contemporaneously we will then um, come back to you with a list of answers um, after the event and as ever, um, you know, your feedback is really important. We find um, ex extremely helpful to get feedback from you all. So if you would take the time to fill in the feedback survey at the end of our, uh, the webinar, that would be really helpful. Um, and if you keep your phones on, there'll be a QR code that will uh, make this quite easy for you. So that will give you a link to the survey. OK, so what are we going to do today? So hopefully to reassure you that um, breast pain uh, alone is not a symptom of breast cancer um, to help you to manage your patients by signposting you to kind of the resources that we have um, and also to to help you to navigate through some of that uh, we've we've managed to um, uh, upload everything to a portal that you can use through the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance website so that hopefully will give you something so you can tap into um, in future as well. Um, Susie's going to run through some patient scenarios um, which are uh, about the management of breast pain and I know she's going to touch on family history as well there um, and then Addie's going to share with you some resources that she has available and talk to you a little bit about the phone lines that uh, breast uh, care now have uh, available to the, to the patients that uh, phone in um, and then we're going to have a question and answer session as I say and then hopefully give you some take home messages to take home with you. OK, moving on, thanks. So as a GP and I'm sure as many um, nurses um, and primary, hair, primary care physicians uh, whatever the role that you're in, uh, know that we we get we get to see a lot of women with breast pain, and it creates an awful lot of anxiety amongst women. Um, you know, uh, I think about seventy percent of women at some point in their lives will um, present with a breast pain, um, and obviously that alongside that goes with a lot of anxiety. Um, breast pain alone, however, is not a symptom of cancer, um, and I think that's the really key point um, that to kind of highlight really from this is that the actual incidence of breast cancer in women with breast pain as a symptom is about 0.4%. Now to put that in context, 
that's actually half the number seen in asymptomatic women who are invited to the National Breast Screening Programme. So basically you're twice as likely um, to have a breast cancer if you just have no symptoms and present to the breast screening. Um, most importantly, simple analgesia and reassurance of first line treatment for breast pain. And breast pain takes up a lot of um, space in the in the urgent breast clinics, um, which could be potentially given over to patients who have lumps and things which are perhaps more likely to be of cancer. Um, so moving on, please, Joe. Sorry, I'm trying to juggle two screens. Just to give you a reminder of um, the most important things uh, to look out for, which are breast uh, cancer signs and symptoms. I'm sure most of you um, are aware of these, but again, some helpful um, resources to, to use here. So the distortion, the nipple changes, any tethering, any lumps in, in discrete lumps this is in the breast. <clears throat> and any um, lumps in the axilla in a patient over 30 years old. Nipple retraction, again, is really, really important, um, particularly unilateral changes um, and um, skin changes that, that are demonstrated here, such as the pod orange is a really important sign. Thanks, Joe. Next slide, please. So I don't know how many of you have seen the referral form. Um, so the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance have a referral form that uh, contains two sides to it. Obviously, the urgent suspected cancer referral for those patients that we've just discussed, but also the symptomatic patients. Um, and one of the recommendations on that um, form is to manage breast pain alone as a symptom for um, uh, four to six weeks using analgesia. Now, this is slightly different from the NICE guidelines, which says 12 weeks. We we feel locally that's quite a long time to try and reassure a woman in primary care and 12 weeks of ibuprofen may not be particularly comfortable on the stomach. But hopefully with some of the things that Susie and um, Addie are going to tell you today, we can we can help to reassure these women in other ways as well. OK, next slide. Thank you. So uh, as the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance, we've um, developed a toolkit, as I said at the beginning, um, which will have all of these resources for you. So the link is there and I think Susie's going to put it in the chat. Um, uh, sorry, Keely's going to put it in the chat for you as well. OK, um, so if you have a little look at that at your leisure afterwards. I'm going to hand over to Susie now, who's going to um, have a chat with you about uh, how to manage patients presenting with breast pain. She's going to talk about some case reviews and talk about family history. OK, many thanks. Susie. Susie, can you turn your microphone up a bit? You're very faint. That's better. Oh, it's a rookie mistake. There you go. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Um, that's, that's brilliant. Um, well, uh, it's, it's a real, real pleasure to be here um, and thank you for asking me, um, uh, Cancer Alliance. And um, my name is Susie Halliday. I'm a, a nurse consultant at Surrey and Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust. And as Joe mentioned, I'm also on the steering group um, for the Association for Breast Surgery Aspire Breast Pain Pathway Evaluation. Um, I work in breast cancer diagnostics and family history surveillance. And um, I've worked in this field for over 25 years. Uh, saying that, I'm, I'm learning all the time. Um, and uh, these days I feel more conscious of the things that I don't know than assured by uh, the things that I do. But um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here speaking with you all and, uh, and to join my colleagues with the Cancer Alliance and Breast Cancer Now. Um, I'm here to talk to you about breast pain and in terms of referrals to secondary care breast services, it's fair to say we're seeing an increased number of breast pain referrals without an increased number of cancers. Um, we've be, uh, we have become aware that this is a growing problem and are seeing that a particular pinch point in the pathway for our breast patients is the one stop clinic where there's insufficient capacity and staff to run these numbers uh, required. Um, this has led to the Association for Breast Surgery commencing a national evaluation to enable us to better understand the need and provision uh, and outcomes for these patients. Um, whilst, oh no, it's okay, back up. Back up a bit. Thank you. We're nearly there, Joe. 
couple more paragraphs. <laughs> um, but whilst, um, whilst we can see these patients in our one-stop breast assessment clinic and effectively exclude cancer, these clinics are not always uh, offering the best opportunity to give patients the time they need to discuss breast pain and to explain what's going on um, and to give the information they need. Um, this has been widely acknowledged and uh, in the meantime, secondary care services across the country have been responding to this issue and setting up their own alternative pathways, um, which I'm sure that, that you've been seeing um, in primary care. Um, some, like the East Midlands pathway, have been adopted by a number of services and there's published data on um, its efficacy. There are a whole series of other pathways to um, all of them of different interventions and some have particular interventions which are just not present in others. And of course, the question is, which of these core interventions will actually add value? With the mainstay philosophy of no innovation without evaluation in mind, the Association for Breast Surgery have supported this national evaluation program. It's called Aspire, um, the Breast Pain Pathway. Um, and so this is in the hope of helping to understand the breast pain pathways that have been set up across the country um, better. Um, I'm fortunate to be working with a team and, and I'll be sharing with you some um, in the first part of my presentation, um, some of the um, slides that, um, that they've provided and the narrative um, that, that they've supported. Um, so I'd like to extend my thanks to the Aspire team for allowing me to share these. For the second part of my presentation, I'll be talking uh, from my perspective alone um, and also sharing with you um, some scenarios that I've come across um, as, a, as a, a nurse um, seeing patients with breast pain in, in um, breast uh, secondary care services. And I hope they'll be of interest. Thanks, Joe. No, that's lovely. Next, next slide. Thank you. So, um, so far, as um, for the Aspire Breast Pain Pathway Evaluation, we've recruited 22 units who have developed their own novel pathways and also five controls. Some units are community-based, but the majority are in secondary care, either face-to-face -face or virtual. Um, some are linked with one-stop clinics and others independently run. Some units derive pathways which work with GPs who manage patients for a given period of time, supporting them with various information resources and asking them to contact them again for onward referral to secondary care should their symptoms not resolve. Some patients are mammogram only. Most importantly, though, these pathways all have built in uh, governance and safety netting. Control groups in the evaluation will be assessing patient pain, um, breast pain patients um, as a part of their one-stop clinic infrastructure and not differentiating between these patients and other symptom groups. Um, we're keen to recruit more um, of both um, and um, access um, remains open via the ABS uh, website. Next slide, please. Thanks, Joe. Um, we've if, uh, we've, um, we've got different components uh, on the pathway, and these are shown in the slide here. For example, uh, we look at whether the pathways are triaged, as most seem to be, um, if they're in the community or secondary care or face-to-face -face or virtual, um, if formal risk assessments are carried out and what imaging is undertaken and which safety netting and patient resources are in place. Next slide, please. It's the intention of the Association for Breast Surgery Aspire Breast Pain Pathway Evaluation to better understand our practices and outcomes for this patient group. Currently, considerable heterogeneity exists between our breast services across the survey, across the country, all of whom continue to do everything they can to manage and um, support these patients whilst also delivering on service demand and cancer wait time pressures for the entirety of their breast referrals. We look forward to sharing the findings of the Aspire evaluation with you and contributing to a robust body of evidence in relation uh, to this to support and manage these patients over the next couple of years. For the final part of my presentation, I'll tell you about how we manage breast pain patients uh, at SASH, um, which is the trust that I'm working in. Um, as with all trusts, we've chosen our particular approach aiming to optimise assessment, support and advice for our patients, whilst at the same time managing uh, and risk assessing the finite imaging provision to align our limited same-day imaging resources with the highest risk patients. 
it's our hope that with improved understanding in the wake of the Aspire evaluation, our service will be further optimised and may even completely change. We'll be guided by the evidence and I'm confident the findings from Aspire will shape our future. Next slide, please. For me, assessing a patient attending a breast assessment clinic falls into three uh, main categories. Um, what are their presenting symptoms? If, if pain, um, I want to understand the patient's perception of their pain, asking them to grade it out of 10, the frequency um, and the history of the symptom. Um, what is the patient's medical and social history? And uh, as we all know, our, our experience of pain is complex and influenced by previous diagnoses, comorbidities, medication, stress, anxiety, and lifestyle factors. And included within this element will be an assessment um, in considering cancer family history, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in one of my case examples. I'll also want to know if the patient's feeling unwell uh, currently and, and if they've got a temperature, um, just to give me um, a heads up on the likelihood that they've got an infection that's underlying their symptom. And finally, um, clinical breast examination, which should include visual inspection with the arms raised, um, as well as down, looking for asymmetry, flattening, puckering, nipple inversion, induration, discoloration and swelling. Skin markings from an ill-fitting bra can also be noted here. Uh, I'll ask the patient if their discomfort changes in severity with movement. Then palpate the supraclavicular fossae and the axillae. I, I, I tend to do this with the patient sitting up, but techniques vary, as you know. Um, then I tend to ask the patient to lie down, facing up on the examination couch. I'll examine the, from the patient's right-hand side, ask them to raise and rest the hand of their non-symptomatic side against their head and, and gently examine with the pads of my fingers in a clockwise fashion around the breast starting at 12 o'clock and then finishing at 12 o'clock, um, repeating the same on the symptomatic breast. I'm mindful that this is not the only way to examine, um, uh, uh, to do breast examination, but all should be methodical, consistent and thorough. I'll be asking the patient to show me where they have their symptom if they haven't already. Uh, they usually have by the time I get that far. Um, and um, I'll be applying gentle pressure to the chest wall and the sternal edge adjacent to their symptomatic breast to check for signs of referred chest wall pain. Next slide, please. Um, depending upon the age of the patient, they may be eligible for enhanced breast screening or genetic testing in the family if they meet certain criteria. And um, a, a breakdown of, of the core elements that are shown here. Up to date family history breast screening surveillance guidance can be found on the NICE familial breast cancer clinical guidelines and genetic testing criteria available on the National Genomic Test Directory for Cancer. Next slide, please. So, breast pain. Um, can be subdivided into three groups. There's cyclical associated with um, menstrual um, hormonal fluctuations, non-cyclical, often unilateral, varying in location and can vary in frequency or be constant. And then there's extra mammary, which is uh, referred pain. Um, I have three patient examples to share with you. Um, they've been made up of mixtures of many patients that I've encountered um, to make them as, as interesting, hopefully, for you as possible. Um, and the images I've taken from uh, free availability on Google, so there's no association with anybody. Um, but I've chosen scenarios which I think might reflect some complexity um, that you uh, could often be faced with in primary care. And in all of these cases, I completely understand why um, GPs have referred their patient in for specialist breast advice. For these patients, all were reassured at the end of the day from a breast cancer perspective and discharged from the service. They reflect what I would have done um, and how my particular service would respond in these instances, but other services may respond differently. And I'm not saying that I'm 100% right because I know I'm still learning all the time too, um, but I'm really delighted and happy to share with you my assessment and my findings and my rationale for the recommendations that I gave. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is Susie. Um, Susie is a 36 year old lady who's presented to the breast clinic with increased pain in both breasts, particularly in the left upper outer quadrant. She uh, grades her pain as an eight out of 10. In terms of past breast history, um, she, when she was 30, she had a lump removed from the left upper outer quadrant, which had normal histological findings. In terms of her past medical history, there's nothing of note. She's on no medications, has no diagnoses, but she is 18 weeks pregnant with a normal pregnancy to date. Next slide, please. We asked her about her family history, and this is a um, uh, this is a pedigree that that I drew up. Normally, we wouldn't have time to draw up a pedigree like this. This would be a family history consultation that would get such a thorough pedigree. Um, however, as you can see. Um, her mum was diagnosed with breast cancer unilaterally uh, in her late 50s. She's uh, still surviving. She's 66. It was a triple negative breast cancer. And her maternal aunt, Mary, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. There's Jewish maternal ancestry. Um, and on the paternal side, there's a unilateral breast cancer in her grandmother uh, diagnosed postmenopausally. So this would fit with a moderate risk family history for this patient um, and mum could actually access genetic testing in her own right um, in accordance with uh, current guidelines um, in view of her triple negative breast cancer being diagnosed under the age of 60. Uh, but even if she didn't have triple negative breast cancer, her mum is still eligible for genetic testing because there's Jewish ancestry and the new guidance uh, offers testing in line with breast cancer and Jewish, Jewish ancestry, excuse me. Next slide, please. So on examination, um, I note the scar to the left upper outer quadrant, um, but uh, there's no new asymmetry um, reported by the patient and certainly nothing that's particularly noted on examination. No skin or nipple changes except um, bilateral breast increase in size, which the patient reports, which is consistent with her stage of pregnancy. Uh, no lumps palpable including to the left upper outer quadrant where she's symptomatic, no palpable lymphadenopathy, uh, no signs of musculoskeletal pain. Um, I've graded it P1, which means there's absolutely nothing I can see or feel that indicates that there's anything clinical of note. Um, in line with that, I've, I've not advised any imaging. I've reassured the patient, I've given her breast pain advice, recommended that she keep a diary, uh, ensure she's wearing a comfortable bra, um, and regular analgesia um, for the first two weeks. Um, and um, as you know, our guidelines recommend for uh, four to six weeks. Um, and, uh, and I totally agree with that. But I tend to say to patients, um, you know, take, it, take, your, take the medication as a treatment, not when you've got pain, but as a treatment. Take it for the first two weeks. If, you don't, if it doesn't get any better, then I'd like to know about it. But the hope would be that actually if they take it consistently that the symptoms um, settle or they find that they can manage them. I also refer the patient to the family history service so she can have a, a complete consultation with regard to moderate risk breast screening which would start from her from age 40 as long as she's not pregnant or, or breastfeeding and of course the advice for mum. Uh, next slide please. So the next patient is Claire. Claire's a 50 year old lady. She uh, presented to us with a two month history of discomfort in the upper central right breast. Worse at rest, she, she scored it six out of 10 in terms of pain severity. In terms of past breast history, she's got no history. She hasn't been called for her NHS breast screening mammogram yet either. Um, in terms of medical history, um, for the past five years, she's been under the care of her GP for the management of anxiety and depression and been taking sertraline for this. Currently, she, uh, she tells me that she's been advised by her GP, she's perimenopausal. She's had aching joints the last year, um, weight gain of about a stone and a half beyond her normal um, weight, which she tells me is because her eating patterns changed because she's been under increased work related stress. She's been taking, um, she's been using um, HRT for the past two months to help manage her um, menopausal symptoms that she's been experiencing. Uh, under the care of the GP um, and she takes ibuprofen and paracetamol uh, um, infrequently as, as she needs it. Um, no significant cancer family history. Next slide please. 
So on examination, visibly the left breast is larger than the right, but she tells me this is normal for her. So I'm not concerned by that. There's no nipple change, there's no nipple discharge. There are markings uh, on her breast skin surface, which indicates an ill-fitting bra. Um, slight increased uh, lumpiness, nodularity to the right upper central quadrant. Um, no uh, discrete lumps, no lymphadenopathy. I've graded it P2 to the right breast where I can feel the lumpiness, but P2 is consistent with clinically benign uh, assessment, P1 to the left breast. So in line with, um, with that assessment, I would be recommending uh, breast imaging for her, bilateral mammograms and a targeted ultrasound to the right breast. I would uh, offer that to her um, to be accessed within two weeks. Um, in terms of my assessment, I wasn't concerned regarding cancer. Um, however, it, it, it is um, uh, good that this will be excluded for her and we can move on to identify the, the cause for her symptom. In terms of differential diagnosis, benign nodularity, um, pain secondary to um, HRT would be my first inclination. Um, and this is supported by current evidence. And we know that uh, up to a third of postmenopausal women receiving hormonal therapy will experience oh, breast pain. Sorry, that was really weird. Is this the uh, yeah, but they were making it was ringing in me. Um, so uh, yeah, up to a third of, uh, of, of women in this situation will be experiencing breast pain, which should resolve spontaneously over time. Um, her symptoms may also, however, be compounded by musculoskeletal discomfort um, and the ill-fitting bra, which can often really make such a difference um, if she gets a well-fitted bra that's comfortable. Um, it, lastly, once we've excluded everything else, um, it's worth considering the, the uh, SSRI that she's on, because sometimes um, this can be associated with, with breast discomfort. Um, next, next slide, please. Well, this is our, our last lady, this is Pippa. Um, she's an 82 year old lady who presents with a two year history of fluctuating aching that she's been describing to the lateral right breast, which just hasn't been going away. Seems to be worse for her on activity. Um, she scores it as three out of 10. It's not agony, but it's just not going away and it's been worrying her. Um, in terms of past breast history, um, when she was 41, back in 1980, she was diagnosed with a grade two invasive ductal estrogen positive breast cancer. Um, and her treatment was a wide local excision with central node, node biopsy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and endocrine for 10 years. Her last mammogram was in 2013 at the end of uh, NHS breast screening call up. Um, and, uh, and that was normal. Um, she's under the care of her GP for osteoporosis and hypertension. Medications are uh, indepamide and uh, codigimal. She, she takes the codigimal as she needs it. Of note, her family history, her sister was diagnosed with unilateral breast cancer in her mid 40s. Um, no ca ovarian cancer family history. And what really um, prompted her to ask to come to see the GP was the fact that a close family friend had recently passed away from metastatic breast cancer. Um, and so she wanted a checkup given her own past breast cancer history and this current symptom. Next slide, please. So in terms of breast examination, um, I noted the scar to the lateral circumareola left breast from her previous surgery. She got flattening to the lateral left breast on arm elevation, may well be uh, as a consequence of, of her previous surgery, um, but not knowing the patient and the patient was unable to confirm for me if it was normal for her, so I have to treat it as new. Um, she's, she was unable to raise her arms above shoulder height um, due to pain in both shoulders, um, which then um, she noticed in the lateral breasts. She reports more severe pain to the right shoulder um, and the uh, right breast on arm elevation. No lumps were palpable are uh, to the symptomatic breast, but in the uh, contralateral breast, nodularity, uh, in keeping with benign change, possibly scarring from her surgery around the surgical site uh, was palpable. Tenderness was noted to the chest wall on the lateral breasts, bilaterally on gentle pressure, uh, more so on the right than the left, no palpable lymphadenopathy. So from that, the imaging that I would be recommending for closure would be bilateral mammograms and a targeted ultrasound to the left breast for the incidental clinical findings. 
um, it's uh, the the impression is one of clinically benign change um, and um, um, uh, referred breast pain um, rather than um, true breast pain. Um, but uh, it, our, certainly our service would recommend imaging um, prior to closure and the findings of the examination would be in line with that. Uh, all was well um, and uh, with, with her imaging and um, certainly evidence indicates that extra mammary breast pain is now the most common breast pain um, symptom that is that that we we're seeing in our in our clinics for patients presenting with breast pain, with causes including musculoskeletal pain, costochondritis, um, radicular pain from cervical arthritis, and and it's also worth noting the additional extra mammary breast pain causes: gallbladder disease, pleuritic pain, and ischemic heart disease. Um, so in terms of outcome recommendations for this lady, I reassured her, um, I said that we'll be contacting her for our imaging within two weeks. And as long as that's fine, we'll be happy to say that what's causing her symptoms is not due to any sinister pathology in the breast. We're recommending um, that she takes regular analgesia for two weeks. And if that's working well, extend to two to three months um, with non-steroidals um, and careful diary, well-fitting bra. Um, and then would be reassuring and discharging her. Uh, regarding her family history, and sometimes it can be tempting not to ask about family history when you get elderly patients in, but it is really helpful and can often feed into the anxiety, I think, that people are feeling um, to, to help uh, put things in contact with them. She's not in any increased risk because of her previous cancer um, so long ago, um, but obviously would be cautious. Um, but with the family history, if she has a daughter, which we'd be wanting to clarify, she would be eligible for enhanced um, surveillance throughout her 40s um, and may well benefit from um, breast screening advice in view of that. Next slide, please. Susie, we're going to have to wrap up shortly. I think this is your last slide, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Jo. Um, yeah, so this is the last slide. Um, now, this is where we ask for your help. Um, we need to understand. Um, how better we can um, support this patient group in secondary care. And um, we'd be hugely grateful for your feedback about your key reasons for asking us to assess them, um, to assess these patients. Um, it's not only uh, uh, valuable for our individual breast services, but our regional cancer alliance and also powerful to take back to the Association for Breast Surgery. So if you didn't mind, if you could pop in the um, chat for us, um, any combination of uh, letters that reflect um, the most common reasons why you might refer a patient to, um, to um, cancer suspected um, breast assessment service uh, with breast pain as their only symptom, um, and whether it will be due to lack of time um, in primary care for advice and support for these patients, unsure about up-to-date information regarding breast pain, um, a cancer family history concern that adds to adds to the to the uh, urgency that they're seen, or uh, only following response from um, or only following non-response to primary care management. Is there something else that, that we just haven't thought of that would be really, really helpful to, to get your thoughts there? And, um, and if this isn't something that you would do, it'd be really good to know that too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. That was really, really helpful. I think those case studies were brilliant because I think it just helps us to kind of stratify the, the different kind of people that come with breast pain. So that's really useful. Thank you. So, um, we're going to have uh, a few minutes for a few questions because I'm sure there's probably quite a lot of questions coming out of that before we move on to Addy's section. Um, so if anybody's got any particular questions, I can see that there's a couple in the chat um, at the moment. Um, so I think one of the questions was about uh, oil of evening primrose um, and that, you know, at one point, and I remember 
being told to prescribe up to 3,600 milligrams. And I, for some reason, I remember the dose randomly, but it was a lot of tablets. I seem to remember it was about six tablets of it. Um, you know, that that was being, uh, you know, suggested at one point. That must have been about 10, 15 years ago, probably. Um, but I think there's no evidence for that. Is that correct, Susie? There's no evidence. Certainly on the NICE guidelines, there's nothing to say that we should be using that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, there's no recommendation for prescribing it. Um, there, there's, there is a school of thought that there may be a placebo effect um, and it might be worth weighing up with your patient whether actually they want to try it on that basis. You know, if it if it makes them feel better, then that's that's great. But but there isn't there isn't evidence um, out there that it uh, that it actually on a functional level uh, reduces breast pain. Yeah. Has anybody got any questions for Susie? I, I know I have, but I won't um, I won't hold the chat. But if you have, pop them in the chat. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask Susie is, um, what constitutes nodularity? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I was. Uh, I've I I thought carefully about even using that word because it is such a difficult thing isn't it but what well, for me you know nodularity is when you can feel lumpiness in the breast um, but you can't feel around the edges of it you can't feel a discrete lump um, and uh, and it's highly likely that it's um, just normal breast physiology that you're feeling particularly in the upper outer quadrants they're prone to it because they're uh, they're, they're they're often more lumpy bumpy um, and if it's asymmetric, I'll clock it. I'll call it nodularity. Uh, but that would be for me in keeping with something with a with a benign, very lightly normal uh, assessment at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, it's where, where there isn't a discrete lump that you can feel, but it just feels different. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really really helpful actually because I think we all we all kind of think we know what it means, but actually just to hear you articulate that is really quite helpful. Thank you. Um, I. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, I can't see necessarily any other direct questions. I think there's been some useful feedback for you. C and D seem to be the 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 hot hot uh, answers for you, as it were, on that. And I think um, Joe Clear has put in about level of patient worry, past medical history, and family history. And I think just to reflect, I think you know one of the problems with the the current or the previous breast pain pathway was that you know we were told to refer people. And they would get seen within two weeks <laughs> and they do get seen within two weeks, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have a cancer. Um, but it's a very different process through which they go through than than a patient with a with a lump. And obviously, um, I think from from what you were saying, I think, you know, you have the triple assessment clinics where you have that kind of one stop shop where. Um, the patients with a with a discrete lump will go. They'll have all of their investigations done, you know, hopefully in one stop. Please stop me if I'm wrong here, Susie. But then the breast pain patients will be managed slightly different, albeit in a similar kind of time frame, but certainly not in a in a in a in a one stop shop. And what we want to avoid is having, you know, patients who are really high risk, um, you know, being disadvantaged, I guess, by patients who are really low risk um, and making sure that the right patients get to the right clinic. So that's why we have those two separate areas on our form to just try and delineate, you know, the breast pain patients from the from the patients with the high risk symptoms. Um, any other questions before I move us on? I can't see any in the chat, so I'm going to move on to Addy from Breast Care Now. So. Thank you, Susie. We'll come back to you at the end. So again, please do put any further questions in the chat as we go along. Adi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I've um, I've had a bit of, bit of problem with my sound, so hopefully it'll yeah. be OK. But yeah, we can hear you. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so I am a um, clinical nurse specialist uh, for breast awareness and breast screening and lymphedema as well. That's not added there, but um, at Breast Cancer Now. And prior to that, <clears throat> I was a, a CNS in uh, in the NHS. Um, I was a lymphedema specialist for a while, and uh, so um, and I've been around for quite some time. So <laughs> I won't tell you how long. But I've now been at breast cancer now on and off. So six years now as a CNS. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> So what do we do? We're an independent um, national charity. 
and um, in 2019, um, Breast Cancer Care and Breast Cancer Now amalgamated uh, to become one uh, big charity. Um, and we are the biggest national charity, breast cancer charity. Um, so, um, and we are a research and care and support charity now. So we brought together breast cancer care. We had the clinical side of things and we merged with uh, Breast Cancer Now <coughs> to um, have the research um, research element of that. We're very aware of all the work that the ABS is doing on the, see, I'm a bit croaky, on the faster diagnosis standard. So things like that do um, promote ch policy change at Breast Cancer Now. So we have a, a great policy team who look at that and all our health information is um it's externally reviewed but it's also it's also driven by policy change so um we have a wealth of health information um I, on, on web pages and our you know uh, printed copies as well um but our the the biggest um um thing that we produce are our services the so next slide please so um our helpline is um one of the largest services that we provide and we basically provide uh um information um and support for anyone with breast health concerns or breast cancer um and it's run by nurses and trained professionals. Not everyone is a is a nurse, but most of us most of us are nurses with a wealth of different experiences. And I'd say about thirty percent of our inquiries are from people with anxiety about uh, breast or auxiliary pain, which isn't doesn't come as any surprise. Um, our Ask Our Nurse emailing service is very popular as well, particularly for the younger younger people. They don't tend to want to pick up the phone. Um, but it sometimes can be frustrating because we can answer questions much easier if people do actually phone us up. Um, and our social media platforms, we have a lot of inquiries via Facebook, Instagram and Twitter now, and we're able to reply to those as well. Next slide. And so what we say is very much what what's been said already, which is quite good <laughs> that we're all singing from the same page that we know that breast, breast pain causes so much anxiety. And, you know, if the, if people do just pick up the phone and speak, you know, speak to us on the helpline, we, it's a confidential service. We haven't got to, you know, it's not face to face. We're able to talk to them in a, a, an anonymous way. And quite often we can, you know, if we speak to them, we can listen to them and communicate with them effectively and reassure them that actually on its own, the pain isn't usually a sign of breast cancer. It's not usually necessary to have a referral to a breast clinic. Um, and, you know, and all the reasons that have been given, you know, for that prior to that. We sort of talk about um, in our health information about uh, Pain charts are really good to focus the mind uh, for people. Um, and and of course, we would always say if if those signs and symptoms or the pain persists, then they they should go and report it to their GP, of course. Next slide, please. And um, the importance of our breast awareness messaging, which um, I'm very, very pleased to see is on the toolkit, um, our touch, look and check uh, message. We really promote, we don't promote such prescriptive sort of check, breast checking, but it's about getting to know what their normal is, because obviously some a lot of people don't have cycles. So it's about checking regularly, say, you know, maybe for um, once a month at first, but maybe every four to six weeks after that, getting to know what feels and looks normal for them. And so if there's new anything new or different, then they can check with their GP. Um, and our <clears throat> signs and symptoms page um, is on our health um, on, on our health information pages, um, as is our um, breast checking advice and our mini guides um, and we do have them in lots of different languages as well so they're quite handy to have so um, 
you know, obviously as GPs, it's very easy to signpost them to, well, to our helpline, but also we can, um, you can look at our website for the information that we provide. Um, and the next slide, and really it's just uh, our contact details. Um, so our helpline is a free phone number and we are actually open on a Saturday morning as well until one. So a lot of people, a lot of our anxious <laughs> callers are phone us on a Saturday morning when they can't really get hold of anybody else. Um, email inquiries, nurse at breastcancernow.org. And the website address, which I've put down wrong, is actually breastcancernow.org, not breastcancercare.org. Losing my marbles. So next slide. So that's it, really. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Very short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really helpful. And we'll make sure that that, that last um, email is ad adjusted when we, when the slides yes. go out. Um, brilliant. I'm so glad I'm not alone at that. Um, so thank you that's really helpful and I have to say I didn't know anything about breast cancer now before doing this web webinar okay. so actually <laughs> you know I think that's a message that we can really use to um, support our colleagues in primary care and and our patients so um, yeah. I think you know hopefully knowing that that helpline is available I think you know hopefully manages some of that time pressure that Susie was talking about because I think there is an element you know you have 10 minutes to do everything absolutely um, and often patients don't come in with one per one thing you know so it's possibly even two or three yeah. things in 10 minutes and and yeah. actually having I think having that dedicated time with patients is really really important um and and giving them the you know the the reassuring advice um yeah. that you need to give and I think also you know referring patients down a two-week rule is hugely anxiety generating Absolutely, for patients yeah. so you know there, there's that there's that balance isn't there to be struck between yeah. actually you know trying to reassure and, and not uh, overly um kind of make them anxious by by actually sending them down a two-week rule you yeah. know when the risks are very low um the other thing I was going to ask um for both of you was was how often do you see patients coming back and back because one of the things I've noticed as a GP in primary care is that it's often the same people that have had imaging that have come back two or three years later and I do wonder sometimes whether there is that element of you know because they've been sent once they need that reassurance of a normal scan to then be reassured again and and it seems to be you know there, there is a little cohort of people that seem to come back on a two to three yearly cycle I don't know if anybody else has had that experience that's on the call but certainly you know I seem yeah somebody's got their thumbs up thank you um I seem to see that you know quite frequently um how do you how do you manage that uh, from your end maybe both Daddy and Susie from our point of view we have um you know we do we have a certain um, cohort of people that phone with their health anxiety and nothing I mean I'm, just, I'm sure it's the same for all, us all isn't it that nothing you're going to say is going to reassure those people um, you know we have a few yeah a few pe repeat callers and uh, they and we you know we used to in clinics as well yeah that uh, kind of wanted to do anything to get into the clinic to uh, be assessed <laughs> yeah yeah and Susie, do you rescan those people if they come to you? <laughs> How well, do you manage it? it? It's yeah, it's a hot potato. And in my experience, there's there's two different types of patients that I've seen come through quite uh, more commonly. There's there's a patient that's come in to me um, with breast pain, and I've examined them, and it and everything's completely normal. They're they're, um, they're under forty. So they wouldn't meet our criteria for um, from for a mammogram because on our, our protocol is that if you've got unilateral focal pain and you're over 40 and you haven't had a mammogram within a year, then you you meet the criteria currently to to access a mammogram as part of a breast check. So if they're under 40, I examine them absolutely nothing to feel. Then I will talk to them about breast pain and. Uh, if I can find something musculoskeletal, then I'll explain that to them, but I won't arrange imaging. But I have noticed that if if they're advised in primary care, and I know it's really hard um, and not always the case, but I have, I've had a few patients that have come through who've been advised, I'm going to send you in to get a scan. And when I don't give them a scan, they then come back again. 
for their yeah. scan to yeah. another clinician who frustratingly <laughs> usually gives them a scan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all right, we've all <laughs> been there, we've all been there. Um, yeah, okay, so I think it's, it's, it's getting that balance, isn't it, between primary and secondary care and really, you know, educating patients early, isn't it, really, about breast pain is not, uh, you know, alone is not a symptom of breast cancer. And maybe, also, you know... also, Joe. There's, there's another group of patients that are um, that I've seen coming back and, and like you were saying, every few years um, mm. and they've come with with what seems to me to be uh, to be musculoskeletal. Yeah. Um, and I think we've got a lot to learn in secondary care um, or in the breast pain, whatever breast pain resources that we build about understanding musculoskeletal extra mammary kind of pain yeah. in more detail because I think this is a really big issue that we've only scratched the surface of I think it'll yeah. make a big difference when we understand it better yeah, yeah. okay thank you um we've got 10 minutes left so I'm just gonna um skip through the the rest of the slide and then we'll have a bit more time for questions if that's all right so I think you know, with all of that said, I think that's really, really useful. I think the most important thing is, is obviously, um, you know, reassurance, I think is, is the big take home message for me. Um, but also obviously thinking about, you know, the risks of developing breast cancer. What are they now? One in nine women in their lifetime, is it now? Used to be more, used to be less, but it's bigger with now raising levels of obesity. I'm one looking in seven. To one in seven it's even oh God, mm. it was I think it was one in 12 when I first started med school so it keeps going to, up as it were um so I think you know really reinforcing the messaging about screening um is is also important with our patients um uh you know obviously we are not in control of breast screening like we are cervical screening in primary care but I do think that we have a role to to encourage our patients to attend and <clears throat> and I think also knowing that um that you could be called for your first mammogram right up into the age of 53, depending on where the bus is, if I call it the bus, but you know, the mobile unit that comes to your Tesco's near you or wherever. Um, and I think that's really important because I think a lot of women get quite anxious around their 50s, myself included, um, about when their mammogram is going to be. Um, and, and actually, you know, one person may be just over 50 when they get called and somebody else, you know, down the road who's three months younger may not get called until they're 53 because the bus has already gone. So you can, um, so I think we need to make sure that our patients are aware that, that that's the case potentially. Um, and just to also remind everybody that you can request screening on an individual basis after the age of 71, so which is when the national screening programme ends. Um, and those are the numbers on the right hand side of that screen um, for the local services. So whichever area you, you're in, you can signpost your uh, patients to that and they will be screened every three years, I think, um, or they have to request it every three years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So so they won't automatically get a recall after another three years. They would have to request it again, but they won't be screened any more frequently than three yearly. Um, and I think the other thing that I probably wasn't aware of was just to make sure that you are telling the patients or, you know, really encouraging the patients to go when the bus is in your area, because if they miss that and then opt to go to somewhere else, they'll always then be kind of out of area um, when that comes around again. So they won't be screened necessarily in area again because they missed their original. So that that's quite tricky, I think. Um, again, I'm Susie and Adi are nodding, but I think that was something, again, I'd not really picked up on in primary care. OK, um, next slide, please. Um, so just kind of in summary, there are um, lots of things. And I think, again, one of the things I took home from this was um, a good fitting bra came up over and over again. And and yeah, you do see the marks, don't you? Particularly from underwear bras, you really do see, you, you know, where they cut into the breast tissue. So I, I think that's a really soft sign, but something that is actually really quite important. Um, and obviously, you know, the analgesia and, and the reassurance um, and the pain diary is really helpful because it will help you to see whether there's any cyclical element to it as well. And I think because we're seeing more and more patients on HRT, we're going to get more and more patients with breast pain as well. Um, so these are the these are the reasons to refer. So obviously, if the breast pain is not responding to, you know, treatment as you've as we've described before, or it's uh, severe enough to affect their quality of life, then you know 
please do refer on the symptomatic breast pathway um, or you know um, and don't forget the advice and guidance is always there as well I think that's that's something we also need to mention is you know if you're not sure use the advice and guidance I think that's pretty much set up in all the trusts now to to be able to turn around some queries and particularly for breast pain you know it's not an urgent urgent thing that you need advice on immediately um, and those are the, the the things that we were talking about is not actually recommended anymore so evening primrose oil flax seeds diets low in fat or caffeine i think there is a there is a bit of a caffeine element with it but that was my again but there's no obviously no evidence but again some people do find um if they cut caffeine out it seems to help um and there doesn't seem to be any obvious um uh difference with changing contraception but again uh, again i think you know for the same reasons you you apply to the oil of evening primrose it may actually help even if it's just for placebo reasons to change so um so we've got five minutes left next slide please thank you so these are the take-home messages <laughs> um breast pain is a common symptom and it causes distress and anxiety as does obviously a two week rule referral for breast pain. So, you know, it's it's a fine balance to be had between hopefully reassuring and um, and then not making patients more anxious by referring them. Um, and, it, and breast pain alone is not a symptom of cancer. Um, you're actually much more likely to have a breast cancer if you're asymptomatic and just presenting to the screening service. Um, and um, next one, please. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then if you're actually having breast pain alone and simple analgesia and reassurance are the first line treatment for breast pain. And if you can, and I th we think it's probably reasonable to try and manage those patients in primary care if you can for four to six weeks. And if at that point you're struggling or um, patients are coming back and back when clearly, you know, you may not be able to reassure them. Um, but you know, for the reasons that we've just described, we can always use other other means. Um, and Breast Cancer Now hotline, I think, is going to be on my desktop from now on. Um, and uh, so breast pain alone with no other clinical features of concern is not a suspected cancer referral. Uh, require, it's not, it's not a, a, an indication for urgent suspected cancer referral. But obviously you have that right side of the form to fill out if that breast symptomatic patient continues to have symptoms that are not being managed in primary care for whatever reason that is. OK, I think that's our take home messages. Oh, and, I, and a well fitting bra, I would add to the end of that list as well. <laughs> um, so this is our QR code. Um, so if you if you wouldn't mind giving some feedback. Has anybody got any other questions before we wrap up? We've got four minutes left. So, you know, however daft they may seem, you know, we can try and answer them. Um, if there's anything particularly that you wanted answered um, around this. something. Yeah. <laughs> and the GPs, you, you put about Danazol and tamoxifen. I'm just wondering in, in the primary care setting, how often tamoxifen would be used in that? It's quite a drastic step, isn't it? Yeah, we would never prescribe it in primary care for breast no. pain. No, no, okay. no, no. That would be a secondary care indication. But obviously a lot yeah. of women are on tamoxifen that we see. Anyway. Um, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and so do they get breast pain from their tamoxifen? No, probably not because you're using it for breast pain symptoms. So, yeah. you know, so we wouldn't we wouldn't initiate tamoxifen in primary care. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that would be on the blacklist on the formulary if yeah. I had to look at it. But yeah. Any other questions? Can't see any in the chat. OK, we well, have two minutes of your life back. So um, thank you so much for joining. It was really, really informative and I hope you all enjoyed it. And um, we will be uploading the webinar and all of the slides and um, the feedback forms uh, and the uh, contact details of everybody onto the Surrey and Sussex um, Cancer Alliance website. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.